brain development actually occurs in three phases. The early phase is created by upward folds of the epidermis that we call uh, neural folds. As these folds occur, they begin to come together midline and begin to form what we call a neurotube. As the neurotube forms, blocks of tissue begin to develop uh, alongside of the developing neurotube, and these blocks of tissues are called somites. As the fusion of the neurotube occurs anteriorly, there's an enlargement that will eventually form the brain and it continues posteriorly to form the spinal cord. So in this uh, three to five week fetus, we can actually see the somites lining along the developing spinal cord and we have the enlargements that are forming the brain. So we refer to this as the primary phase of brain development and when it occurs there are three enlargements that we can see the most anterior of the three enlargements is the prosencephalon. The middle of the three enlargements is the mesencephalon and then the posterior of the three enlargements is the rhombencephalon. So as we move from this three to five week old fetus toward a five week old fetus, what we'll see is the enlargements have continued to enlarge and we still have three enlarged areas that are associated with the brain, the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. Now as we move out to about seven weeks, then what happens is the prosencephalon subdivides into two bumps the mesencephalon does not subdivide, and then the rhombencephalon subdivides into two bumps. So what we're doing is moving from a primary uh, phase of brain development into a secondary phase of brain development. So these are called secondary brain areas or vesicles. And if we start anterior again, we have a prosencephalon now, a diencephalon, the mesencephalon that retains its name because it didn't subdivide, a metencephalon, and a myelencephalon. This is going out another week later where these developments are actually becoming more pronounced. So one of the landmarks we can use for the first two is the developing eye. So what we're seeing is the development of the retina of the eye here. And so it's kind of at the transition between the prosencephalon and the diencephalon. Again, the mesencephalon hasn't changed. And then as we move backward, your developing ear is right here. And so it's a good landmark for the final two, which is the metencephalon here and the myelencephalon here. And then as we move downward, we again can see the spinal cord that's developing and the little uh, blocks of tissue that we call somites lining up along. Remember in lecture we talked about the fact that the brain is encased in connective tissue to protect it from chemical changes that are too quick, from mechanical trauma, and from pathogens. So the outermost layer over the brain and spinal cord is a very dense layer which is referred to as the dura mater. So on this sheep brain, half sheep brain here, we're actually seeing the dura mater from the outside covering the entire brain. Now as we, as we pull this tissue away, then what we're going to be able to see is that there's actually a space that exists uh, on the inside of this. And so there's a shiny surface on the inside of the dura mater, which is our second mater, which is the arachnoid mater. And then there's actually a space that exists between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, which would be the subarachnoid space. And then as we look at the surface of the brain itself, uh, as we pull this away, then there's actually a shiny surface on the surface of the brain that we can stick our probe through as well. And so that's our third meninge, which is the pia mater. So these three connective tissues, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater are all collectively called meninges and if they become inflamed then you would have a, a disease we would call meningitis.
So as we look at the brain, the cerebral cortex is the highly folded area of the brain, and it's subdivided into uh, two hemispheres. So what we're looking at here is one of the hemispheres, and each, each hemisphere is subdivided into lobes. Now fortunately, the lobes of the brain are corresponding to bone that overlie them. So as we look at the front of the brain, we have the frontal lobe. As we go toward the middle of the brain, we have the parietal lobe. As we go to the back of the brain here, we have the occipital lobe. And then as we go to the inferior lateral aspect of the brain, we have the temporal lobe of the brain. We have an internal lobe of the brain that we can see by separating a, the brain along what's called the, the lateral uh, sulcus. So if we pull the lateral sulcus down, we see an internal lobe of the brain that is inside of the others, which is the insula. The two cerebral hemispheres are separated by a deep groove that separates them into left and right sides. So the deep groove is called the longitudinal fissure. And as we turn the brain over, we can see that the longitudinal fissure completely separates the frontal lobes into left and right sides and then completely separates the occipital lobes into left and right sides. The ridges on the brain are referred to as gyrus, or plural would be gyri, and the grooves in the brain are referred to as a sulcus, or plural again would be sulci. So we do have landmarks that separate the lobes of our brain uh, into distinct lobes. So when you're looking at the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, there's a sulcus that's very complete going from the lateral sulcus all the way to the longitudinal fissure. And when you find that, that is called the central sulcus, and it separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. As we move posterior, and it's a little more easier to see on this brain, we have a subdivision that separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. Uh, usually it's easier to find internally. So again, we have this deeper groove that's running uh, through this area here that's actually separating the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. So it's referred to as the parietal occipital groove or sulcus. Now as we move laterally on the brain, what separates the parietal lobe from the temporal lobe is this deep groove right here, which is the lateral sulcus. As we move back to the central sulcus that we were just referring to, which is the groove that is the most complete going from, again, the lateral sulcus to the longitudinal fissure, then we actually have uh, elevations or gyrus that are in front of this groove and posterior to the groove. So the groove is called the central sulcus, and the gyrus in front of it is called the precentral gyrus, and the gyrus posterior to it is the postcentral gyrus. Now we do have colored models that help uh, help students try to find some of these these structures. So on the colored model, uh, we have a sulcus that starts here at the lateral sulcus goes all the way up to the longitudinal sulcus. So this is our central sulcus. On this model, the red is our precentral gyrus, and the blue is our postcentral gyrus. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of take a tour of the external aspects of the brain that we can look at. So the cerebral hemispheres can be referred to as as hemispheres with the lobes that we just talked about. The second largest part of your brain are, is this structure here, which is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum uh, is involved in coordinating muscle activity. So when you look at the sheep cerebellum to cerebrum, when you look at the cat cerebellum to cerebrum, which we have, we have models of both those out, then what you'll find is their cerebellum is lar larger relative to the rest of their brain than ours. Hence, they're more coordinated animals in terms of uh, their abilities. So if we take the cerebellum and we pull it down and 
so that it's no longer in place, as you can see on this model, then what we end up with is we end up with a structure on the posterior aspect of what we call the brain stem here that actually has two bumps on each side. So it's called the corpora quadrigemini. And so obviously the, the key to the name is quad, telling us that we should find four of these bumps. So the two uh, superior bumps are called the superior colliculus, and the two inferior bumps are called the inferior colliculus. And what we'll explore in lecture is the fact that the superior colliculus is involved in visual reflexes, and the inferior colliculus is involved in auditory reflexes. Now again, we can compare the size of the, the two colliculi between a human and a sheep, and what we'll see is in humans, the superior colliculus is smaller, the inferior colliculus is larger, uh, implying that we are very auditory animals. Uh, in a sheep, what we'll see is that's reversed, that the superior colliculus is going to be much larger and the inferior colliculus is going to be smaller, and it, it really implies that there are more visual animals. So as we look at the inferior view of the brain, uh, then in the area of the brain stem, which is this structure coming off the inferior aspect of the brain and running down in front of the cerebellum we were just doing, can be subdivided into this enlarged area, which is the pons, and then this area inferior to it, which is the medulla oblongata. Now as we move upward, the role of the, the brain stem is to allow communication between our higher brain centers and our spinal cord. So we have to have connections between the brain stem and our spinal cord and the brain stem and our higher brain areas. So if we look lateral, so if we pull this brain apart and look lateral, there's actually an elevation right here which is called the cerebral peduncle. Anytime we use the word peduncle as it is reference to the brain, it's actually a connecting track pattern. So we're going to see that we have a cerebral peduncle connected to our brain, and we're also going to have peduncles that connect our brainstem to the cerebellum that we'll talk about in lecture. So as we look at the inferior aspects of the brain, uh, there's an enlargement on the inferior part of the frontal lobe which is involved in smell, so it's, it, the reference is olfaction. And so the enlarged end of this is called the olfactory bulb. And as you'll recall, when we learned the skull, there was a ridge on the ethmoid bone in the skull that we said was a cella, that was the crystagalli, excuse me. And the crystagalli actually fits into the longitudinal fissure of the brain. And then on either side of the crystagalli, there was actually a flat plate with little holes in it that we called the cribiform or horizontal plate. And the olfactory bulb set in that uh, cribiform or olfactory plate. Now, we, we have to learn a, a new word that is descriptive within the central nervous system. So when we're looking at a model, these white things that are arising from the central nervous system and going out into the body are called nerves. And they're aggregates of nerve fibers. This is actually arising at the olfactory bulb, which is part of the uh, brain, and then traveling back toward the brain. So even though it looks like a nerve, because it's an aggregation of nerve fibers, uh, anything that's part of the central nervous system that's nerve-like is called a tract. And so the, referen the reference to this then is an olfactory tract that is carrying olfactory information back to the brain itself.